Ache Willow Season 5 Chapter 14 The Natural Order of Things I have to tell someone. I can't be mistaken when I say that we've all been there, can I? That moment of emotional boiling over, when something so momentous, so utterly big happens that it must be spoken. It's the kind of feeling I suspect the Germans have a long, difficult-to-enunciate word for. Something like Freundschaftsbezeugen, an absurd word that I swear exists. It means something like showing friendship or demonstration of friendship, I'm not sure. Tonight, I need a word like that to describe this impossible desire to talk to someone, anyone, about Baxter the dog. They come and get me in the waiting room. I'm given shots and prescribed antibiotics. After an hour, when it's all said and done, I'm offered a pamphlet on the health risks of interacting with wild animals. It's taken from a tall pile of freshly printed literature. You can still smell the ink. During the whole ordeal, I bite my tongue not to tell the nurse about Baxter. I hold back from spilling the beans to the doctor on how I know what's happening to Aquilo's animals. It takes all my willpower not to confess my knowledge to the poor orderly that stands by the door while I put my pants back on. I've cracked the case and am now burdened by this knowledge with no one to talk to. Eric, I'm told, will be released the next morning. No surgeries for him, but they want to keep him under observation for a few hours. I hope they don't ask too many questions about where he got those wounds. Who knows what an Eric on painkillers might start telling them. Also, I don't think my brother is the right person with whom to talk about this. Annabelle probably took off to Jordan's place for the night, finding there a bed to sleep in and perhaps a bit of comfort. The details are none of my business, but I'm sure as hell not going to be the one to knock on that door at three in the morning. Calling Detective Wilson is tempting. The animals are his case, and I'm sure he'd be glad to hear it's been solved. An easy caller for him. But Aaron Wilson is an acquaintance, not a friend, which is what I need right now. Not an employee like Stefan or anyone with whom my relationship is strained like Gulliver. As I hobble down Rue Principale, I'm reminded of the one member of my Aquilo family I know who will listen to me. The friend that, while annoyed, will open her door at this accursed time of night. Well, I think it's clear what I'll be getting you for your birthday this year. Helen Edna, notary public, opens the door to her apartment wearing an off-white silk nightgown and just enough annoyance to make me doubt my decision. Hi. A watch, Miriam, she says, stepping out of the threshold to let me in. You're supposed to ask what, and I was going to answer a watch. Thus, the joke would be complete, punchline and all. I shake my head like I'm trying to get a bee out of my ear. It's an attempt to jostle my thoughts back into place. The context of my visit isn't compatible with the revelation that Helen has a sense of humor, especially not one she exercises at this time of night. Sorry, I'm a little out of it. I need your help. <laughs> I certainly hope so. It would be puzzling if this were a social call. She walks behind, guiding me towards the kitchen. Helen Edna's home is expertly decorated in a stunning minimalist style. Not the empty white places from Hollywood movies. Spaces remain occupied, but in ways that allow copious breathing room. The eye is never quite left hanging on the edge of a cliff. Walls are never completely blank, and every corner is flanked by some small accent to guide one's vision through the void. It's all calculated, sparse, clean, and sterile. And... Not at all my vibe. But it is uniquely Helen. After a seemingly endless walk through her huge apartment, we end up in the kitchen. And I hate it. It's barely a kitchen at all. Everything that might hint at someone ever being able to cook in there is hidden. The refrigerator doors are the same as the cupboard. The stovetop looks like a shiny black mirror nestled between two slabs of midnight-colored granite. 
Only the sink and oven give away that this is where food is prepared. You'd think Helen was ashamed to admit she ever ate. I figured it out, I say, taking a seat at the island counter. I know where all the pets of Ake Willow have vanished. Helen raises an eyebrow. For the first time, I notice that even without makeup, her features look almost perfect. At this point, I'm starting to lean harder into the theory that she's a robot or a clone. I was going to make coffee, but should I pop a bottle of champagne instead? I stick my tongue out at her, but she doesn't even notice, busy pulling out a coffee machine instead. It's one of those department store ones, fancy but soulless. Still, coffee is coffee. I know who, but I'm not sure what to do about it. Aaron is on that case, isn't he? Why not let him handle the details? Just be happy you solved it without incident. Thin, well-manicured fingers manage to pull apart coffee filters without struggle and scoop out spoonfuls of store-brand coffee grounds without spilling a grain. She fills the coffee pot from her elegant faucet before pouring the contents into the machine. Well... Helen clicks the button on the coffee maker, then raises her eyes to wait for me to finish. Well... It turns out this is less of a missing pet situation and more of a Demons of Ake Willow thing. She sighs, shaking her head. Helen then takes out a couple of mugs, along with some sugar from a cupboard and milk from the fridge. I'm a little surprised to see that one of the mugs is in the shape of an overweight Himalayan cat, blue eyes and all, while the other has the words, I don't notarize before my coffee printed on it. I know it's not the time, but I hope I get the cat mug. Demon eating the town's pets? If only it were that simple, I explain. Someone is stealing pets and trying to feed them to the demon, I think. I couldn't see very clearly. The coffee maker gurgles and spits, slowly dripping brown liquid into a pot opaque with fog. Helen leans on the island counter to get away from the sound. Ah, so this is something you witnessed yourself. The demon, I mean. In spite of my warning not to bite off more than you can chew. I know, but who else is going to take care of a demon? Helen licks the tip of her finger before dabbing the sugar in her sugar bowl. She then licks the residue off. All the while, I can see the tension of her face as she considers her next words. I understand you might hesitate asking the Inquisition, but isn't it Veronique and Marie Bell's job to do that? Well, again? I've been spending a lot of time with Annabelle Lagasse, and she and her mom aren't really seeing eye to eye these days, so... So you thought you'd get involved? The coffee maker clicks, announcing it has finished its task. But Helen doesn't notice, hiding her head in her hands instead. She shakes her skull slowly, coming to grips with everything I'm telling her. Is that it? She demands. I think so. Oh, except my brother is in the hospital. The demon bit him. It takes a moment for Helen to collect her thoughts. All the while, I feel like I'm waiting for my mom to react after I've told her that I flunked a class or broke a glass, knowing the results won't be good, but anxious to find out how bad. You took my advice and did the exact opposite, didn't you? Getting involved in as many things as you could possibly find. And now you're here asking for what exactly? She raises her head to face me at last. I expect more exasperation, with perhaps a bit of anger or disappointment. Not at all. Helen Edna, notary public, has somehow managed to regain her full composure during that brief hiatus. She remains stern, maybe, but without judgment. I can't just not help people. I'm sorry. Standing straight once again, Helen picks up the pot from the coffee maker, pouring the contents into the two waiting mugs. She then slides the milk, sugar, and cat mug across the counter to me. You are her great-grandniece, there's no doubt about that. Despite it all, I can't help it, and I smile. This is probably the closest thing to having Doris's approval I'll ever get. Sure, it sounds like Helen is giving up on me being a better person, and it sounds like I'm setting out for a life far riskier than I first assumed, but I'm living up to who Doris was. And Doris was formidable. You still want my advice? Helen asks. 
I nod, taking a sip of dark coffee from the cat mug. Do you promise to heat it this time? I promise to try. Another shake of her head, followed by a few spoonfuls of sugar in her own mug, but Helen still delivers. Pick one. Pick a crisis and handle it the best you can. Then delegate the rest. Tell Maya Byrne about the demon and be there for Veronique's daughter. Or leave both issues to sort themselves while you take care of your brother. Dedicate yourself to fixing the demon problem and let Aaron handle the missing cats and dogs. You can't expect to do a single thing well if you're spread out over too many problems. I'm sure you can figure out a proper cooking analogy for that one. I can, and she's right. No good kitchen functions properly with a single chef trying to make every dish. This is why there's a hierarchy in a restaurant, and why the larger the operation, the more complex and varied the menu, the bigger the staff. Now wipe that smile off your face, finish your coffee, and let me go back to sleep. I'm going to ignore her advice again. Not as a conscious choice. I'm not being purposefully defiant. The dark streets of Aquilo, tinted orange by evenly spaced out street lamps, seem less inviting than ever. The threat of a demon having followed me home, or perhaps a vengeful demon hunter, is real, but still a faint aftertaste compared to the potent spice Helen's dilemma poses. I'm too much like Doris, it seems, and she's trying to warn me against that. Everyone tells me that Doris was wonderful. She was a pillar of the community. What a formidable witch, baker, and friend Doris was. But Doris is dead. A fact which puts Helen's warning into dire perspective. She's trying to protect a friend, maybe even save my life. But I'm going to ignore her advice. My nature isn't to leave such things alone, and I simply do not know how to pick and choose between crises the same way I've never learned to back down when my skills as a cook and baker are questioned. I step up the stairs to the apartment, and I sigh, loudly. Being pig-headed certainly is a trait of mine, and <laughs> look where it got me. The key to the apartment slides into the lock and twists without resistance. The door swings open without my even touching the handle. My heart sinks with the realization. I left brioche here the very best little locksmith in all of Aquilo's back alleys. She must have gotten bored and taken on the front door. Hopefully, she didn't go after the macaron sprite, or worse, allow Roberts to waddle out into the streets. The fattest little raccoon still has a bit of convalescence to go before I can even attempt to release him, if I ever get the chance. I flip on every light of every room I step in, rushing to check on Roberts. You little bastard, I say, relieved. I guess your sister didn't have the patience for my hospitality? The door to the bedroom was already open, but Roberts hadn't dared pass the threshold. I suspect the presence of a food bowl and cushy cat bed have something to do with that. Glad that this isn't a bigger crisis, I walk over to the drawer where I stash the kibble for Roberts. I shouldn't overfeed him, but I doubt a few bites will be that big of a deal. Except... Roberts doesn't seem to care. He's not that rotund because he makes a habit of ignoring food. Pastries, cookies, kibble, and sandwiches, he'll eat them all. Not tonight. Not right now. Instead, he dances around, his tail moving in frantic circles while jumping from his front paws to his back paw. He keeps the prosthetic off the ground, but there's still an urgency to his behavior. What? You love this stuff. He coos and growls and dances some more. For once, everything is fine. I guess the better you feel, the more restless you're going to get, aren't you? Bang. I was bending over when the loud metallic impact nearly killed me. The shock of it alone made me stumble forward and almost knock my head on the vanity. Then there's the heart attack I'm halfway convinced will finish me off. Steadying myself, both physically and mentally, is a tour de force, but after a second, I manage. Automatically, I want to blame Roberts for whatever that was. What did he break? Is that why he's not taking food and performing his bizarre pantomime? Looking around, I find the source of the sound. 
Right behind me, lying on the ground, picking up hints of light from the street outside, is my door handle. My breathing becomes short and loud as I walk closer to the object. The struggle to understand why it fell floods me with anxiety. There are no good solutions. Brioche picks locks. She doesn't pull them apart. What are the chances that the screws came loose on their own? Who would break into my home? Why? The answer to that comes not from a thorough inspection of the apartment or leftover clues by the perpetrator, but rather from the paws of my house guest. Roberts, with much difficulty, catches up to me near the door. But he's got no designs to escape. He's not here to beg for food, water, or even attention. Standing uneasily on his healthy leg while putting very little weight on his prosthetic, he stands as tall as he can. With a pathetic coo, he holds up, held between his claws, Brioche's ribbon. Oh, no. I grab the ribbon and, repeating myself, step outside. There's no sense or reason for rushing out. There was no one in the street when I arrived. The criminal is long gone, but I have to check. Oh, no. No, no, no. Not her. Not Brioche. Ignoring the soreness in my leg or the open door to my apartment, I take the steps two at a time on my way down. My head swivels this way and that as I look for any sign of my main suspect. I listen for the sound of dogs or the jangling of tags. My senses are on high alert, ready to spot the most subtle shadow or hear the faintest sound. But I'm confusing panic for attention. Hey! She appears out of nowhere, blocking my last path off the metal staircase. I know her as a lot of things. Condescending and smug, irritating and irritated, or even, on occasion, somewhat pleasant. Tonight, however, Ophelia is a specific brand of fury. I don't think I would have noticed the subtleties of her mood under normal circumstances— in any other context, the only thing I'd see is an angry young woman wearing far too many knits for the weather, with her fists on her hips. Where is he? Gulliver? I don't know. Isn't he your- My cat, Miriam. Where is my cat? All right, Ophelia, I think. Calm the hell down. But also, I get it. Can't say I'm feeling very good about Brioche's disappearance. Ophelia. I start, raising my hands in a gesture of peace. I have no idea where William is. I'm struggling to better assess what I'm up against. Furious Ophelia is a brand new version of this already belligerent nuisance. The way she's got her hands stuffed inside that giant bag of hers makes me uneasy. What has she got in there? Certainly not a gun, but I wouldn't put it past her to have a knife or other makeshift weapon. For the first week of my time in Aquilo, I did essentially the same thing, keeping a fillet knife in my purse. The hell you do, she presses. I swear, if you've so much as touched a whisker on him. Her knees bend a little, and I can see her shoulders tense, like she's about to pull whatever trick she has at the ready. But apart from the increasing aggression, she seems satisfied with her threats. I have absolutely no reason to hurt that cat. I try to explain. Maybe you get on my last nerve, but William has never done it. Oh, please. We both know why you'd want the meat off someone's familiar. Okay, I think. First off, if she cuts me off one more time, I'm going to punch her little round face into a bloody mess, I swear. Second, though, what is she even talking about? Meat off of... You think I cooked your cat? I wait for a moment, giving her a chance to explain. The very idea is so horrific as to be insulting. Apples don't fall too far from the tree, Miriam, and you come from a very rotten tree. You're talking all sorts of nonsense. I don't even know what a familiar is or why I'd want the meat. A lot of pets have gone missing, and I think that you know damn well what a familiar is. Without even thinking about it, my fists ball themselves up. I take a step forward, but stop short of laying into her. It's a tremendous feat of willpower not closing the rest of the distance and breaking all my knuckles on her cheekbones. I have William, and you have your filthy raccoon. But if you think for a moment that I'm powerless without it— Wait, shut up. Don't you 
dare to shut up. I look in my hand to the ribbon that's usually around Brioche's neck. I've no idea what nonsense she's talking about being powerless without our familiars, but it doesn't matter what I believe, does it? It's all about what Ophelia believes right now. If she pulls out a knife and tries to stab me, it's a reaction to what she thinks is going on. My opinion on the matter is irrelevant. And if Ophelia believes this, then maybe she's not the only one. Listen, I pull out my best voice of reason to try and appease her. Give me my cat. Listen, I don't have William. Brioche, my filthy raccoon, is also missing. Someone literally broke into my apartment to get her. Are you listening? I already know she is, though. At the mention of Brioche, something eases in her posture. Nothing too obvious. Every limb is precisely where it was a moment ago, but the tension is pulled back. Her knees, elbows, and shoulders have found some softness again, and her features appear to struggle to remain fierce. They only took brioche, not the other raccoon or anything else in there. They came for her, specifically her, and only her. My own distress is starting to bleed through my words. It's finally hitting me. He took brioche. My familiar, or whatever Ophelia wants to call it. It doesn't matter. He took my brioche, and I have a sinking feeling I know what his plans are for her and William. Ophelia sees it, my strength draining at this realization. But where I'm falling apart, she instead found purpose. She put forth the alchemical formula that turns grief and fear into anger. Sure, she focused it in the wrong place, but it's absolutely the correct answer to this situation. I square my shoulders and straighten my neck. My fist closes over Brioche's ribbon, holding on so tight it hurts. And I know who did it. Working with Ophelia, no matter in what capacity, isn't exactly what I had in mind when I got up this morning. Credit where credit is due, however, she is the one responsible for unlocking the solution to this whole fiasco. Well, partially responsible. I also have Horace to thank, which is weird under the circumstances. This isn't a truce that will last long, however. The list of ways Ophelia and I are incompatible as partners, let alone friends, could be written in fine print and still take up most of Rue Principal to enumerate. Could you hurry up, she demands, for what must be the fifth time. We're wasting time. <laughs> She's not exactly wrong. With the limping and hobbling, I'm no race car when it comes to speed. The fresh bandage and even fresher painkillers do help, though, which is a blessing. But it remains that this is a damaged leg I'm dragging across town in the middle of the night. I'm doing my best, I offer as a weak explanation. Just tell me where we're going and I'll run there. I don't need to wait on you. I can handle this by myself. My molars grind against each other and I double down on my efforts to keep up. What a strange sensation to use a damaged limb but without feeling any of the pain that should go with the exercise. The scabs over the wounds and even the pieces of flesh in the punctures themselves, I register all of them as one rubs against the other. I know the wounds are being pulled open again, and I can even feel some blood seeping into the bandage. Painless sacrifices to this emergency. No, I don't trust you. You don't trust me? She sounds genuinely shocked by the notion, which is par for the course when it comes to Ophelia. Never does she have a doubt that she is the paragon and I the villain and idiot. My feelings toward your family aside, I will do my best to bring your raccoon back alive. But I can't do that if we get there and both our familiars are dead. Is now the time to ask what her problem with the Dufour women is? It isn't. It really isn't. But that doesn't mean the question doesn't burn to be asked. You thought I was going to cook your cat. I don't see why I should trust you any more than you did me. We're finally beyond the Canada-U.S. border. Our destination is only a few minutes away. It's tempting to make the detour to Detective Wilson's home and have him bring in the cavalry. In fact, a simple phone call could do it. However, if we show up and there's a demon dog rampaging around, 
I don't know that a dozen confused cops are going to help with the situation. Am I glad to have Ophelia, of all people, along for this? That is a completely different situation, Miriam. She stops. Is this it? There's a house across the street. It's a fairly big one with a single garage and two stories. The aging home is covered with wood paneling that looks black in the rare light. Flanked by a clothing store and a real estate business, it is indeed our destination. Yeah, I say, somewhat defeated. That's the place. How could it be any other, really? Setting aside that I've been here before, it's the only house on the street, and maybe the only one we've come across on our long walk with lights on. We're not talking about the occasional tiny square window from the bathroom or a porch light kept on by paranoia. Living room, kitchen, bedrooms, and everything else is well illuminated from within. The kind of lighting situation that would have had Dad cursing at me and Eric for wasting electricity. Most damning of all, though, are the two narrow windows from the garage door, partially blocked by boxes and clutter, but just as well lit as the rest of the house. Irritation leaves way to that broiling fury Ophelia met me with earlier. She tolerated my slow hobbling to guide her here, but she is once again ready for a fight. I don't know what that would look like. She's a diminutive, vintage, clothes-wearing young woman, a granny decades before her time. But just like I feel like people shouldn't underestimate me, the same goes for her. The way she cocks her head, craning her neck forward, I'd almost guess she too knows the place. This is Mary Mitchell's home, she says, confirming my suspicion. Her husband took my cat? I've never heard Meredith refer to as Mary, even by Horace. I think so, but don't let that fool you into thinking all is well. He's not just lonely for company, or at least there's more to it than that. You think so, or you're sure? As if set upon a well-oiled walk, her simmering animosity always slips back to the middle, which is where I happen to be. I'm not barging into an old widower's home based on a gut feeling. I shrug. We haven't walked this far just to get in yet another argument on the Mitchell's front lawn. Suit yourself. I limp around Ophelia as fast as my numb yet aching calf will allow and drag myself to the front door. My right hand finds the doorknob, prepared to give it a twist and a shove, but my left index presses the doorbell instead. Just like the last time I visited, the pack inside loses its collective mind. Barks, ranging from the deepest growl to the highest-pitched yip, crash against the sound of the bell, drowning it out immediately. No time to wait, because that was never the plan. I push the door open. Inside, ready to welcome the two witches at the door, is complete pandemonium. There are more dogs and cats in the living room than the eye can count, not with all the running around happening at the same time. Scanning the living room and then the kitchen, I try to find familiar features. A ringed tail and a masked face, or, failing that, an orange mass of feline apathy. Nothing. I occasionally glimpse a dog I might recognize, but context doesn't allow positive identification. The one thing I can guarantee without hesitation is that these are not all Horace's animals. I begin wading through the sea of mutts and good boys when something nips at my ankles. Trauma memory from my more recent bites and from seeing Eric's calf turn to cutlets makes me wince. But this isn't an attack. Someone wants my attention. Dragon! It's ridiculous how glad I am to see a friendly face in this ocean of strangers, especially with Ophelia at my back. For the first time since they took Eric away at the hospital, I feel like I might have an ally. Boy, oh boy, I say, ruffling the fur on his neck, setting his ample jowls to flap about. I know somebody who's going to be glad to see you. Nothing would make me happier than to take Dragon back to his owner and companion, but I have other business to handle first. I don't see him, Miriam, Ophelia complains, uncharacteristic distress in her voice. William! I can't feel him. If Brioche and William are as special as Ophelia claims, being our so-called familiars, then they could very well be somewhere else, possibly with Horace and almost definitely in immediate danger. 
I need this, I say, tearing the purse off Ophelia's shoulder. Before she can swing a fist at me, I'm already ripping through the thing. Skeins of wool fly out to the greatest joy of surrounding dogs. I'm more careful with the uncanny number of knitting needles I find, but they aren't the target of my hunt. It's only when I pull out a mouse, made of crocheted wool, that I relinquish the purse. Unless Ophelia has far stranger hobbies than I could have imagined, this is one of William's toys. And at my legs, sitting obediently, is Aquilo's best tracker. Dragon. I hold the mouse in front of his nose, letting him get a good whiff of the scent. Can you find the kitty? Can you? Pickering's prize hound doesn't need to be asked twice. I only see him hesitate for a moment, presumably looking around for Darling, but without further urging, the dog is off. Low to the ground, and not a very big animal to begin with, Dragon is a little difficult to keep track of amongst the remaining menagerie. Some of the animals are pouring out of the house, making good their escape. Others have already taken to following me or Ophelia around. Only Dragon walks like a dog with a purpose. Nose to the ground, only lifting to the air to get his bearings, he makes a beeline to the back of the house and through the kitchen. Without hesitation, I pull the back door open, allowing even more animals to flee. Dragon scuttles into Horace Mitchell's darkened backyard, entirely disappearing from view. The ringing of tags on his collar call to me in the night, stopping every few seconds allowing me to catch up. Eyes adapt to the lack of light, drinking in more thirstily whatever they can find. It doesn't take long to realize we've left the Mitchell backyard. We can't have gone far. Perhaps we've woven ourselves between the backyards and loading docks of homes and businesses, entering the maze of alleys and back streets that line Aquilo. So dark is the night here, far from street lamps and shielded from the moon, that for once I can see the hellhound before I smell it. Two dimly glowing eyes, red as dying embers, peering from deep in the shadows ahead. Dragon growls, having picked up the scent of the beast. I know, boy. The cracking of gravel under my feet slows down with my pace. I'm in a hurry to find Horace and save Brioche and William, but weaponless against the demon, I hope to keep my distance. Miriam, the old man's voice calls out from farther ahead. Fancy finding you here. I thought you'd be taking care of your brother. A stray beam of orange light, weak from its journey from the street, catches Horace Mitchell. He looks like a character from a noir film. Except, instead of a raincoat and fedora, he wears slacks and a jean jacket. In his hands, there's no gun or cigarette, but a diminutive raccoon and an angry cat, both held by the scruff of their necks. Horace... I was hoping you wouldn't be here to see this. In fact, I was surprised to see you in the forest. Didn't think you have the stomach for this. Don't do this, Horace. The two glowing eyes are getting closer, bringing with them that stench of fetid, burning meat. Well, he sighs, weary and tired. I don't think I have a choice. I thought, you see, I thought the dogs would be enough. I started with stuff from the store— then I tried with one of my cats, Pepito. The old tabby didn't have much life left in him anyways, but that didn't do. That's when it occurred to me. The beast doesn't care about an old, dying cat. It needs to destroy something loved, right? But, but you saw. You saw how little it cared for Baxter. It needs more. The old man lifts his arms, showing me the two animals in his hands. Brioche looks confused and terrified. The last couple of years have taught me to read her features, and I know fear in them when I see it. Her beady black eyes, lit with their own glow of blue, buried deep inside her skull. William has more fight in him, exchanging terror for fury, but his efforts so far have drained him. Half-hearted attempts to claw at his captor fail, each weaker than the previous. Power. Horace whispers, as if it were a secret between the two of us. It craves power. I hope this works, Miriam. I'm running out of ideas, and I don't think Meredith would want me to try people. One step forward on my part is met with one backwards on his, bringing him closer to the hellhound. Dragon circles to the side, flanking Horace, but the old man sees him. It won't work, Mr. Mitchell, I assure him. 
This isn't what the demon wants. There are tears in the old man's eyes. A quivering of his lower lip testifies to the doubt in his heart. Deep down, he must know this is pointless. Or even if it did work, would it be worth it? It has to work. It has to work because I promised. She loved animals so much, Miriam. Do you know how snails consume prey? Mr. Mitchell, I say, watching the closing of the demon dog. A giant snail will suck down a worm into a mouth lined with thousands of teeth, flaying it alive. Horrible, isn't it? What a cruel way to eat. But Meredith understood that that's the natural order of things. You can't blame an animal for the diet it has. He smiles, turning away from Dragon and me. The hellhound has arrived, slowly revealing itself from the shadows into that stray beam of streetlight. Mr. Mitchell! I scream, pushing myself into action. Horace, no! I thought he was coming around. I thought he was realizing the horror of his actions. As I watch him toss, first William the cat, and then my precious little brioche towards the hellhound, I realize just how terribly wrong I've been. Aquilo is written by J.F. Dubow and narrated and produced by me, Amy Frost. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast platform. Want to support the show? Buy us a coffee. Go to ko-fi.com slash Aquilo to donate. Aquilo has a Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash Aquilo for details. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under the username Aquilo. Aquilo.